Hi folks, welcome to the show. Okay, so in this course we're going to talk primarily about physical anthropology. And associated with that, or tied in with that, are human origins. Our human origins really developed over 8 million years ago. They started developing. We've since uh, kind of changed and evolved over time and become what we are today. So as we go through this, I'm going to start out by explaining how these changes were noticed, how we understand what's going on. So to start with that, we have to start talking about what science is. How does science know anything? How do we know anything? And to talk about that, first we have to really get into what is it about this science that makes us able to look at that kind of thing. First of all, what is anthropology? And how do we work within the confines of science to understand these things? And moreover, how does anthropology work? Well, the first step about anthropology is there are several different aspects of anthropology. None of them work in a vacuum. They're all interconnected. All of them have to rely on all the other three to really understand anything. As a result, our school, most schools, teach what we call a four-field subject or four-field anthropology. What four-field anthropology means is that we teach at least the basics of all four subfields of anthropology. The oldest and largest subfield of anthropology is cultural anthropology, which is far over to the left here on this image. Cultural anthropology is the study of living cultures and societies. The reason that they tend to study living peoples is because they have to be able to ask people what they're doing. They ask these questions through not only observation, a specific thing uh, that is distinctive to cultural anthropology called a participant observation. That's where they try to participate in the culture and observe at the same time. They also do several other things like questionnaires and something called an ethnography. An ethnography is a study of a given ancestry or ethnicity. This is a cultural study of what they're doing and why they do it. You can imagine this happens all the time. Every single one of us has done this in an informal context at one time or another. Every time you want to join a group, uh, in the, even in the United States, who does something, like if you want to be in a group of people who build cars, or a group of skateboarders, or a group of people who do whatever it is that they do that you want to do, you have to start learning how to do what they do. What is it in their subculture that makes them unique? The next one over is archaeology. This one you're probably aware of already. Uh, Indiana Jones, everybody has ideas of Indiana Jones. Is it Indiana Jones? Not really. Indiana Jones would be more like a grave robber <laughs> than what actual archaeologists do today. Um, Archaeology is the study of past societies. So essentially, they're doing the same thing as cultural anthropology. The only difference is nobody's around to ask anymore. So the tools change. Instead of questionnaires and ethnographies, now they're digging and looking. They're looking at remains of things, artifacts, things that people left behind, tools, food, places, buildings, things they use. All of that helps them understand what was going on in the past society, but how can they understand that? Well, obviously, they've got to understand cultural anthropology in order to do archaeology. Oftentimes, when we see something coming out of the ground in an archaeological context, we go, okay, who else uses something like this? What is this similar to? And then you can ask and see and study what that was. Sometimes that's not available. In which case, they do what's called experimental archaeology. That is, they start playing around with these things, seeing what they can and cannot do with them. The next one over is linguistic anthropology. This is by far the least known anthropological subfield. Linguistic anthropology studies languages. But if you take linguistic anthropology, you're not going to walk out knowing how to speak Swahili or Chinese or any other language. 
That's not what they do. They, in fact, study how languages grow, evolve, and change over time. How they, where they come from, how they're in invented, how they start, and how they die. Languages have a lifespan. You know this. Even our own language changes drastically, time and time again. The meanings of words shift from one thing to another. Uh, they get changed over time with various things that associate with our culture or our culture associates with them. For example, uh, saying the term a good Samaritan. All good Americans know what good Samaritan means. But do we? The term good Samaritan actually is associated with a Bible story about a Samaritan who is actually a good person. Truth is, in the Bible, at least in that aspect of the Bible, Samaritans were evil, wicked people. They were the enemies of the current culture. So a good Samaritan was a surprise. Even now, you can see it's been reduced down to Samaritan. So you can see it on the news. Oh, a Samaritan stopped and helped out, or a good Samaritan helped somebody driving past, or whatever. That is a completely different context of what its original meaning was. We do this all the time. If you would have gone back to like before the 1990s and started talking about the World Wide Web, people would think you were talking about a giant spider. Things change really quickly. And the fastest place that these changes happen are in slang. Slang terms and slang words change more quickly than any other aspect of linguistics. It's pretty interesting stuff. Finally, we get to physical anthropology. Physical anthropology surprises a lot of people because they think they know what it means or they have no idea what it means, especially if the only anthropology they've ever been exposed to is cultural anthropology. What is physical anthropology? Physical anthropology, we're actually looking at the human body. We're looking at the human body as an organism. We're studying the human body. So we study bones. We study what happens to bones. We study how these bodies change and adapt to given different places. We deal with living people. We deal with dead people. We deal with fossilized people. We do forensics. All of that is physical anthropology. With one interesting little twist, we actually study primates, at least here in the United States, as well as part of physical anthropology. And I'll explain that in a little bit. So what exactly is physical anthropology and what do physical anthropologists do? Well, physical anthropology is the study of human biological evolution. And another weird, weird word that went way over to the right on the second sentence, biocultural. Bioculture. What the hell? What is bioculture? That sounds like biology mixed with culture, and you're right, it is. Bioculture. This is a weird word that we only use in physical anthropology, and it's really interesting, and it comes up a lot. In fact, we'll talk about this a lot throughout this course, bioculture. Bioculture is based on two key concepts. Number one, each person is a product of their evolutionary history. Now, normally I go around and ask the class what, this, what they think this means or whether or not they can come up with any uh, um, kind of examples of that. Well, try to do that on your own right now. Biological things are that which is your body. Biological things are your body as an entity. You know you have five fingers and toes. You know that you have one nose, two eyes, etc., etc. So you are the product of your evolutionary history. What does that mean? Well, it means all of the above. We have two arms, and on the end of each arm, we have five fingers. So do all the other apes. In fact, all the other primates. I say other because we are primates. Indeed, we are apes. So we'll talk about that even if it offends you. We'll talk about what that means and how to understand what that means later on. How are you the product of your evolutionary history? 
Why do you look the way you look? Well, you get that from whom? Your parents and their parents, etc., etc., on back. Your race, and I hate to use the term because it doesn't mean anything. We'll talk about that later. Your ancestry, that's a better term for it. Your shape, your color, the color of your hair, naturally, not if you dye it, etc., etc. The type of hair you have, straight, curly, long, well, long and short is different. Straight, curly, blonde, brown, black. Whether or not you have good vision or bad vision. Do you need glasses? Etc., etc., etc. All these things are from your evolutionary history. You get it from your genetics. You get it from your parents and their parents all the way back. The second key concept is a little bit more difficult to understand. Each person is the product of an individual life history. Oh my God, what does that mean? Let's go backward. Your individual life history, what does that mean? That means your lifetime, your experiences here on the planet. You are the product of what you do with your body during your lifetime. That should make sense. A combination of environment or genetics can tie together in such a way to change your body permanently. Think about ways that your body changes permanently. For example, broken bones, tattoos, piercings, all of those are permanent, unless you go in and get the laser surgery, but that doesn't count. You get the point. Why would you get a tattoo? Think about what a tattoo is. It's being poked incessantly with a needle with ink on it to get it underneath the subcutaneous layer of your skin so that it is there forever. Is getting a tattoo painful? Yes. Is it supposed to be? Yes. If getting a tattoo wasn't painful, it wouldn't count. It'd be like, I don't know, painting your nails. It doesn't count. The pain is part of, in our culture, the tattoo. It's a, a, and the permanence of it is also culturally important, isn't it? You could get a tattoo that's not permanent. No, you can get a lick and stick tattoo any day of the week. Doesn't mean anything though, does it? And yet, if you get a tattoo of your, I don't know, your child's name, or a friend who you've lost, people do that all the time, and they do it for a reason, and it's in a big, meaningful reason. But that is how. You, your body, is the product of your individual life history. This can also be not, in, not on purpose, too. If you were skiing and you broke your leg, well, that's a skiing accident. That's cultural, too. Why the hell do you strap two pieces of wood on the bottom of your feet and go down a hill? Well, because it's fun. But it's a cultural thing. So, you broke your leg doing it. Doesn't sound fun. No, no, you'd have to explain to this alien that came down, doesn't know what skiing is. You have to explain to them, well, no, it really is fun. Normally, you don't break your leg, but I accidentally broke my leg. But, you know, it's an injury that I now have, and your body will show that injury for the rest of your life. So, bioculture, we're going to, don't worry if you're not completely grasping these concepts right now. This is just an introduction. As we go along, you're going to learn more, you're going to see more and more examples of all these things. And it should make more and more sense. So, you've been an anthropologist now for about 10 minutes. <laughs> what are these people doing? What are they looking at? Normally, I go around the class and ask this. And people pop up with answers, and almost everybody gets it right. So chances are the idea you have while you're looking at this picture is correct. Your first thought may be, it's a grave. You clearly see dead people bodies in there, right? Dead skeletons. And then you see the way the people are excavating this grave. They look kind of like archaeologists, except archaeologists generally don't work directly with human bodies. They're more interested in the things people leave behind. The human body part falls under the parlance of 
the expertise of physical anthropologists. What are they looking at? What is this? Well, if there's a dead body in the ground, we call it a grave. But you may have a little bit different term for that. Is this just a grave? Is this a bunch of grandparents and children and people who were loved and cared for and interred into the ground? No. How can you tell? You've been an anthropologist for 10 minutes. How can you tell that this is a mass grave? First of all, think about that word, mass grave. It's got meaning tied to it, doesn't it? It's not just a grave. It's not just a graveyard. This isn't a cemetery. Mass grave comes along with all kinds of thoughts of violence, people who are being inhumane to other people or inhuman, the inhumanity of man, to other people. These people weren't loved or cared for. You can see how they're thrown in and jumbled up into this grave. They weren't put in there with the love and caring and the grave goods and the gifts that we bury grandma with. No, this is quite different. This often is associated with violence or hatred or Masquerades can also be associated with something that's not violent. It may even be a, a culture that is forced to create a mass grave. These are usually due to things like plagues or a natural disaster. So these are often associated with a lot of different things. But the way that we understand what that is is because of the way they're excavating it. The people who are in this image, who are excavating these other humans, are learning everything from them that they can before they pull those bodies out. Imagine this. If I took those bodies out of this context and I laid each one of these skeletons, if instead of these people in the field working on these skeletons, instead it was an image of a science lab with a whole bunch of tables and there was a skeleton on each table, would you know it was from a mass grave? No. Can we learn more by looking at the skeletons in a very controlled environment? Of course. But once we remove the body from the ground, we lose the rest of the story. We lose that context. So something we have learned from archaeologists is every time you remove something from the ground, you destroy its context. So before removing it, you take photographs, you take measurements, you take readings, you take, you draw these things. You do as much to get as much data as you can on these things before you lift them out of the ground and destroy that data. Because once they're moved, they're moved. However, you can then get a lot of other information that you cannot get while they're in the ground. For example, what's underneath it, or what happened to their backside, or whatever. So it's all, it, it all has a place, but I already demonstrated how archaeology leans heavily on uh, cultural anthropology, and actually vice versa, because archaeologists can tell you the story of what built up to become that living society as it is today for cultural anthropologists. Physical anthropologists lean heavily on archaeology as well as cultural anthropology to understand what we're looking at. We can describe bodies all day long, but we have to put them in their context to understand what's going on. And the only way you can put these things into context is to understand all the different aspects of anthropology. That's why four field is so important. Here's another physical anthropologist. What's she working on? She's doing DNA, strontium analysis, trace element analyses, things like that. These are chemical aspects. She's a chemist, but she's a physical anthropologist. This woman, the one in the pink, working with these people. Well, these people are alive and they're just standing around and they're doing their basket weaving and stuff. How is she a physical anthropologist? Because she's not there to get an ethnography on their culture, although their culture plays a big part. 
She's actually looking at what they're doing with their bodies throughout the day. You can see the woman who's working on the basket weaving in front of us in the foreground here. She's squatting. Squatting is a very common thing for humans to do around the world. Uh, our culture doesn't do that too much. We generally lean and sit and lay. But a lot of other cultures squat. And some people within our own culture squat quite a bit. The squatting, habitual squatting, can actually show, show up. See that in their skeleton. We're going to see how the skeleton is very dynamic. And as we go on, we're going to talk about bones and how bones grow and change and how they sort of react to the way that our lifestyle forces them to do. What's this guy doing? Well, clearly he's posing for an image, a picture. But he's measuring bones in a lab after they've been excavated out of the ground or wherever. And what we're able to do in the lab working with bones is different from what we do in the field, collecting the bones. Both of these are extremely important to understand fully what is going on with those bones. This, by the way, in his, in his left hand is a human femur. That's the upper thigh bone. And you can see it has a, a, a device on it that's got a, uh, it's been broken, in fact, probably shattered. And they put in what's called a rod in common parlance, but what that is, it's a titanium bar that's been screwed onto the bone to stabilize the bone in life and help that person heal. It does sort of the same thing as a cast, only from the inside. It seems to be a little healthier, actually. What's this person studying? She's looking at teeth. Are teeth bones? I'm smiling right now. Teeth are not bones. You know this already. If you break your arm, does it heal? Yes, it does. If you break a tooth or chip a tooth, does it heal? It does not. Teeth are made out of completely different stuff than bones. They're formed differently from bones, and they grow differently from bones. But they're very important, and they are part of the human body. Therefore, they're part of what we look at. The other aspect of what this person is working on is their fossils, ancient bones and teeth. So from that, we know this person is still a physical anthropologist, but they're working in paleoanthropology, which is a subset of physical anthropology. They're looking at our pre-human ancestors, our pre-modern ancestors. It's important to know. Two things on this image. First of all, I hope you know who this woman is in the image. She's one of my favorite people on the planet. She's an amazing woman. Her name is Jane Goodall, and she works very closely with those things that are also in the foreground of the image. Those are chimpanzees. They're a great ape. They're one of five great apes. There's actually an image here of two of the five great apes. Jane Goodall, as is you and I, is a great ape. Humans are great apes. That means a big ape. We are very large. Chimpanzees and bonobos are also considered great apes, as are gorillas and orangutans. We're going to talk about those things later on, toward the end of the second part of this, uh, of this course, second unit. I, it's getting harder and harder for people to recognize this image, and I understand that. It's been a long time. This is Ground Zero in New York at 9-11-2001. And those, the, all those people in those Tyvek suits with the hard hats on, the blue, yellow, and white hard hats, those are physical anthropologists. What are they doing? They're sifting through the rubble looking for human remains. That is our job. It is not the job of the excavators. It's not the job of law enforcement because we recognize bone better than anybody else in the world. Individual, fragmented bits of bone is absolutely what we do. These are forensic anthropologists, and you can bet that is a sub-subset 
of physical anthropology. Okay, our first little quiz. Relax, it's not a real quiz. Nobody's going to get tested on this. But I want you to think about it. What is the most derived, meaning the most unique, part of the human body? What is it about the human body that makes us so unique, so different from all the other primates on the planet? Bet you have a couple ideas in your head. Probably not the correct answer, though. What's the most unique or derived part of the human body? I'm going to throw out a few things that everybody tells me when I ask this question in a live class. Number one, most people think it's the brain that makes us so unique. Nope. Turns out every single primate on the planet has a huge brain for their body size. We're a very smart order of animals, primates. All primates are smart. In fact, all of them have an enormous brain. And what's more, throughout history, we actually do not have the largest brain in our family tree. Anatomically modern humans, you and I, our brains are actually a little smaller than one of our ancestors. That annoys us a little bit. <laughs> okay, so what's next? The most derived part of the human body. I'll tell you the next one I hear about the most often. Our thumb. Oh, we've got an opposable thumb. Oh, we show off about our opposable thumb all the time in front of our cats and dogs. We go, aha, you can't feed yourself because you don't have an opposable thumb. It's true, they don't. And it's true that we do. What that actually means is if you hold your thumb out or your hand out in front of your face, you can touch your thumb and your pinky finger together, the tips of your fingers. Hey, that's pretty cool. But guess what? You guessed it. Every single primate on the planet has that same ability. They all have opposable thumbs. In fact, their toes are more are opposable. Ours are not. So what else is the most derived part of the human body? What's so unique about us? Well, is it that we have a different shaped spine? Kind of. Different shaped hips? Sort of. Knees? Mm, we're getting there. The most unique and derived part of our entire human body. Ready for this? The foot. What? Our feet are so designed to walk upright. Bipedal locomotion. That's what we call this. Walking on two feet. Bi, two, pedal, feet. Locomotion means movement. We walk on two feet. And that's what makes us so unique. In fact, in fact, it's so important that we walk on two feet, it's actually, literally, the reason you and I and our entire species are here today. We would have died off as a species before we even got here. Over 8 million years ago, we would have died out were it not for our ability to walk efficiently on two feet. Isn't that crazy? In fact, all other primates living today walk on all fours. They can step up onto two feet. We'll talk about that. We'll address that later on. They don't do it efficiently, though. We can climb a tree, but we do not do that very efficiently. You don't believe me? Try to race a chimpanzee up a tree. You won't even get started before they're done. In fact, everybody likes American Ninja Warrior. Try watching that show with a chimpanzee on it. And all of a sudden, the people don't look all that impressive. <laughs> our most derived part of our bodies, 
the foot.